Hello, I'm your host, Noah Berlatsky, and welcome to another edition of Prestasia Conversations. This month, we're talking to Alan Walker. Alan is an assistant professor at Old Dominion University in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice. They earned their master's in social work at Columbia University and their PhD in criminal justice at John Jay College and their graduate center in the City University of New York. Their research focuses on institutional harms, especially those created by our criminal processing, immigration, detention, and mental health care systems. So, and specifically, we're talking about Alan's book, A Long Dark Shadow, Minor Attracted Persons and Their Pursuit of Dignity. Um, So the book is a study of non-offending minor attracted persons, uh, a group that hasn't been discussed a lot either in the academy or in popular culture. So it's a difficult and important subject, and we're thrilled to have Alan with us today to talk about it. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much. So uh, my first question was, you know, even the title of your book is pretty controversial, right? Because the subtitle is Minor Attracted Persons and Their Pursuit of Dignity. And many people are concerned that the designation of minor attracted persons or MAPS um, suggests that it's okay to be attracted to children, or they're worried that the term suggests that pedophilia is a sexual orientation, um, which they worry is a slander on LGBT people. Um, So could you talk about why you use that term in the title and throughout the book? Absolutely. And thank you so much for that question. Um, I use the term minor attracted person or MAP uh, in the title and throughout the book for multiple reasons. Um, First of all, because I think it's important to use terminology for groups that members of that group want others to use for them. Um, And MAP advocacy groups like Before You Act um, have advocated for use of the term MAP. Um, They've advocated for it primarily because it's less stigmatizing than other terms like pedophile. Uh, A lot of people, when they hear the term pedophile, they automatically assume that it means a sex offender. uh, And that isn't true, and it leads to a lot of misconceptions about attractions toward minors. Um, I've definitely heard the idea that you brought up, though, that the use of the term minor attracted person suggests that it's okay to be attracted to children. Uh, But using a term that communicates who someone is attracted to uh, doesn't indicate anything about the morality of that attraction. Uh, From my perspective, there is no morality or immorality attached to attraction to anyone because no one can control who they're attracted to at all. Um, In other words, it's not who we're attracted to that's either okay or not okay. It's our behaviors in responding to that attraction that are either okay or not okay. Uh, And I want to be extremely clear that child sexual abuse is never, ever okay. But having an attraction to minors, as long as it isn't acted on, doesn't mean that the person who has those attractions is doing something wrong. Um, I think we have a tendency to want to categorize people with these uh, with these attractions as um, evil, excuse me, as, as evil or morally corrupt. Um, but when we're talking about non-off- non-offending maps, these are people who have an attraction that they didn't ask for, uh, and one that is uh, frequently they would give anything to change, but they find that they're unable to change those attractions. Uh, and most importantly, Uh, the people in my study did not act on them. Um, Something else you brought up was the idea that using the term MAP could suggest that attractions to minors are a type of sexual orientation. Uh, Whether or not attractions to minors are a type of sexual orientation is not a question that can be answered with my particular research. Uh, My research touched upon the labels that MAPs use to describe themselves, though, and a lot of them have been really conscious about their choice of language because they don't want to slander, as you put it, um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. So they'll use language um, to kind of distance themselves from LGB folks, which I talk about more uh, in my book and in other articles that I've written. Um, there's a lot that could be said about whether attractions to minors are in themselves a sexual orientation. And there's research that I cite in my book about that. But to me, that misses a larger and more important difference, which again is about attraction versus behavior. Uh, If we did consider maps to have their own distinct type of sexual orientation, there would still be a huge difference between maps and lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. Uh, And that difference is that maps have a sexual attraction that would result in a lot of harm if they acted on it. Whereas for LGB folks, there's no harm in having consensual relationships with one another. Um, So that's where the distinction lies. Uh, Again, it's really in that difference between attraction and behavior. Um, And non-offending maps, by definition, do not abuse children, so their behaviors are moral. Um, But they're still being subjected to this same idea that they're bad people, and they've often internalized that for themselves. 
So that's why I've used this subtitle, Minor Attracted People and Their Pursuit of Dignity, because a lot of the people I interviewed for the book have encountered people who have told them that they're bad people or monsters just because of their attractions, um, or the, they feel that same way about themselves. And it's often a process for them to just stop feeling internally like they're monsters. Some of the people in my study had been going through this process for years, decades even, and some of them had just started it, maybe even just weeks before we spoke. You know, seeing my participants be so affected by the stigma against them was really hard because they were trying their best to be good people. So it was important for me to use language that was as non-stigmatizing for them as possible. There's kind of a lot of a lot to pick up there, but <laughs> I guess I guess the one thing that I wondered if you could talk about a little more just to start is, um, you know that the term pedophile is often used. I mean, people use it to mean people who are attracted to minors, but they also kind of use it to just mean people who abuse children. Um, and I guess you sort of are, say that there's sort of a difference there. Could could you talk about like what the difference is and like why it's important? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is such an important topic to bring up. So thank you for that. Um, it's funny because when I give talks uh, and mention that pedophile doesn't mean someone who has committed a sexual offense and is instead referring to attraction, I still see phones come out because people will be Googling to see if I'm correct in my language choice or not. Um, but yes, there's a big difference between MAPS and child sexual abusers. Pedophilia is a clinical term that indicates uh, a sexual attraction to people who have not gone through puberty. Uh, MAP refers to someone who has preferential attractions to minors, and that can include children who have gone through puberty or not. Uh, and then child sexual abusers are people who have committed a sexual offense against a child. Uh, many of these people are indeed MAPs. But first of all, there are many people who commit sexual offenses against a minor who are not attracted to children in general. Uh, we know that abusers commonly commit sexual offenses for reasons related to power, control, and access, not because of, tra uh, of attraction. So many child sexual abusers are not MAPs. And then just as importantly, many MAPs never commit a sexual offense against a minor. Um, that difference is important because when we don't understand that distinction, we make incorrect assumptions about the likelihood of offending amongst MAPs. This leads, people, uh, leads to people believing that just because someone is attracted to minors, they're likely to commit an offense. And we start to criminalize a population uh, just because of their attractions. Not only is this a problem in terms of criminalization, but it also serves to heighten stigma against maps in general, which is a huge problem. I was also, I mean, does it make it harder to sort of like um, identify child sexual abuse in general, if you're sort of focused on this one population who isn't necessarily always the ones doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, if we're, if we have this idea that um, child sexual abusers look a certain way, are a certain way, um, we're going to be missing uh, the majority of um, offenses that are committed because we're so focused on on this one idea. So that um, in the book, you say that you, your initial work was with victims of sexual violence. Um, and I think a lot of people sort of find it odd that you would that one that a person would go from there to to sort of researching minor or attracted people, um, especially in sort of such a sympathetic way. So I, I guess, like, what led you to this project and to trying and I guess, how do you reconcile that with sort of like trying to um, be empathetic or work with victims of sexual violence? Yeah, so I, I had worked with victims of sexual abuse as a counselor, uh, which is one of my very few, uh, sorry, very first jobs as a social worker. Um, it was both heartbreaking and infuriating to hear about people's experiences with sexual victimization in that capacity. And, and all I really wanted to do was protect them from the pain that they were experiencing, um, which I couldn't do. Uh, and when I was trying to help them access help through the criminal legal system, uh, it was frustrating that the system wasn't helping the victims. Um, and that was most of the time. Um, most of the time it wasn't helping them, not in the way they needed. 
Um, so I started further noticing the ways in which the criminal processing system really contributes to harm when I ended up facilitating a support group with women who were incarcerated and who had been victims of sexual violence. At that point, I started having my eyes opened to institutional harms that were caused by the criminal processing system as a whole, um, to those who are criminalized and to those who are victimized alike. Uh, as I started learning more about the system, I learned more and more about all, all alternatives to the way we currently deal with people uh, who commit offenses. And a big part of that is in offense prevention. I actually worked for many years for an organization that developed alternatives to incarceration through violence intervention, restorative justice in, uh, initiatives, alternative court programs, and so on. But I never heard about any initiatives that attempted to prevent sexual offending against minors. Um, actually, through engaging in this work, I never even understood that people with attractions to minors and people who commit offenses against them are entirely distinct groups. And I actually remember learning about that from a news article while I was browsing online, uh, and it totally shifted my understandings about sexual offending. I became really interested in researching maps from the perspective of preventing uh, sexual offending against children. Uh, and I began attending workshops led by Before You Act, the advocacy group I was discussing earlier, um, as I developed my research about maps. Uh, my research study ended up including interviews with 42 minor attracted people. And in those interviews, I asked participants about the, their experiences with coming to terms with their identity and coping with the stigma that they faced, as well as about how they've strategized not to commit offenses. My purposes for asking about their strategies for non-offending um, are probably obvious as I'm interested in offense prevention and I figured MAPS personal strategies would have relevance to other MAPS who might be struggling with some kind of temptation to act on their attractions. Um, but my reasons for asking about my participants' understandings about their identity and their experiences in forming it might not be quite so obvious. Uh, initially, I saw those questions as something that would just give context to how they strategize not to offend, so pretty much as background information. Uh, but as I attended workshops and met MAPS in person and through interviews, I heard about these experiences and how scared MAPS often were when they realized that they had this attraction that's pretty universally, uh, universally maligned. Although I'm not a MAP myself, I'm queer, and so I too have been through experiences in realizing that I have attractions many people wouldn't understand and that some people find to be immoral. And those experiences have really shaped who I've become. And so I sort of empathized with those experiences and I wanted to learn more. So sort of, so you're sort of talking about sort of stigma against maps to some degree here and, uh, and sort of empathizing with their, with their experiences of stigma. And, you know, I mean, when I, I think a lot of people think that people should be stigmatized, right? That, that if you have, um, that if you're attracted, that attractions to minors should be very strongly stigmatized in order to prevent people from thinking that they're okay or from acting on them. Um, and that, that, I mean, in your book though, you seem to be arguing for less stigma. So, could you talk about like why what's wrong with using stigma to sort of like prevent sexual violence in this way and um why would you rather see stigma reduced yeah absolutely um i do talk a lot about stigma um i think we believe societally that stigma against maps um serves to protect children because somehow we don't fully understand the differences between maps and sex offenders um, again, we have this confusion between the attraction and a criminal behavior, which I stress is uh, stress so much is just a huge problem. Um, stigma against maps is a problem in part because it makes maps think that they're monsters. Um, that's really problematic in terms of map well-being. Um, it's really hard to cope when you think you're a terrible person uh, because you have attractions that you can't change. Um, but it's also hugely problematic because when maps get the impression that they're destined to commit an offense against a child, they might not realize that it's a choice that they have uh, and that there's help out there if they feel some kind of temptation to commit an offense. Not only is this a problem because it affects how maps understand themselves, but in the event that a map does decide to reach out for help, their stigma has huge consequences for the kind of help that's available to them. 
For instance, if a map sought out one-on-one -on -one therapy with a counselor, they might not know whether the counselor fully understands the difference between someone who has an attraction to minors and someone who has committed an offense against a child um, because of that stigma. Um, you know, uh, counselors are just like anyone else. They might know that, they might not. Uh, if they end up in therapy with a counselor who mistakenly believes all MAPs have committed an offense or will do so at some point, their therapist might end up making a report against them that they shouldn't be making. Unfortunately, some MAPs have had that exact type of experience, which discourages others from help seeking, uh, even when they might really need that help as a non-offending strategy. So the stigma that we have against MAPs throughout society can not only affect well-being, but it can actually lead to harm against children. I guess this is a sort of related question, but I mean, you know, your book is talks a lot about sort of the depression and isolation, which many maps feel because of because of stigma and uh, because they're considered, you know, they're basically considered to be sexual abusers. Um, and I think I think many people are sort of like uneasy with the idea that you should really empathize with them. I mean, even if you think stigma should be reduced, the idea that you should really be thinking about them as victims themselves in some ways. Um, you know, people are concerned that that takes the set, you know, you're no longer centering um, victims of sexual abuse themselves and that that can lead to um, I guess pushing for policies that might harm child sexual abusers or that might make it easier to offend. So, I mean, like, is that something you're concerned about or sort of why does sort of like a more empathetic, empathetic a more empathetic approach to maps seem like the way to go to you? Yeah, um, it's not at all uncommon to have these questions. Um, some of the feedback I've gotten about my book and my work in general is that um, empathizing with maps somehow, quote unquote, encourages them. Um, but the reason that maps deal with depression and isolation is due to the stigma that I've been talking about. Um, and that stigma itself can lead to harm for maps and children alike. Um, sometimes I hear from people who think that maps need to work on getting rid of their attractions for themselves altogether. And on one hand, um, just because someone has attractions to children uh, doesn't mean that they won't ever experience attraction to adults as well, or even that their attractions to children will persist for their entire lives. Um, sexuality can be fluid, and there are many maps who have a range of attractions to both children and adults. Um, and sometimes those attractions can fluctuate, uh, just like any other attractions. On the other hand, we also know that such methods as conversion therapy are not at all effective. Um, and yet that tends to be what people think of when they believe that MAPS should be trying to get rid of their attractions. Um, that they should go to some kind of therapeutic intervention where they can be converted. Um, but that's not really an option. Um, so what is an option? Getting those MAPS who want, uh, who want it into some kind of affirming therapy where their provider understands that their attractions don't make them a threat um, and who can help them navigate strategies for non-offending if it turns out that they need those. Uh, that kind of work does focus on preventing child sexual abuse um, and that kind of help is not available uh, as widely as it should be. So we need to focus on making it more widely available. Um, at the same time, in answer to, to your question about focusing on potential victims of child sexual abuse, absolutely, we should be focusing on that. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't aim to have prevention strategies that focus on MAPs who are at risk of offending as well. Too often, our child abuse prevention strategies focus on teaching children about stranger danger, which is ineffective because most children who experience abuse are abused by someone that they know. Uh, we also have child abuse prevention strategies that focus on teaching children to say no to adults, which is good for children to learn about, but places the burden of prevention on the child rather than on individuals who might be at risk of offending. Uh, by lowering stigma against attraction to minors, we can more effectively focus on getting help to people who are at risk of committing an offense. So one thing I wanted to ask you is your book is about maps who specifically don't offend or, or have not committed child sexual abuse and I and one of the things you talk about is is you ask them why they haven't offended and so what what what's their answer why why do most of these people why have why have they not 
acted on their um, these attractions or why haven't they harmed children? Yeah. Um, so that's a really great question. And one that I had a lot of assumptions about as I went into my research. Um, I was getting my PhD in criminal justice at the time, and I had the belief that the maps in my study weren't offending because they were afraid of being put in prison. Um, but what I found out from talking to maps was that the reason they weren't offending is because they would never want to harm a child. Many of them talked to me about experiencing love for children and understanding inherently that if they committed an offense against a child, it would be deeply hurtful. Uh, for most of my participants, that was enough to keep them from ever even considering acting out on their attractions. Um, I ended up feeling pretty embarrassed that I hadn't understood that from the start, because at this point it just seemed so obvious. Um, my participants generally felt that hurting a child would be the worst thing they could possibly do, and, and they wanted to be good people. So I also wondered, I guess I'm curious, have you, have you done research with maps who have offended or is that not a population who you've looked into at all or? Uh, that's not been um, a population that I've specifically looked into. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there on offending. Um, and so I really wanted to focus on, on this topic that is, at least at the time um, I, I began my research, um, a lot less explored, which is the, the population of maps who do not commit an offense. So what strategies do they have for not committing offenses? Uh, yeah, there, so there are a bunch. Um, a big one was uh, reaching out to um, a therapist. Um, and that's, you know, the, the one that uh, I focused on um, in terms of discussing this big problem with stigma um, and that I've already kind of talked about, um, especially when therapists aren't available or um, have these kind of stigmatizing opinions about MAPS. Um, another one is that they can reach out to family or friends, um, especially if they're going to be in the presence of a child. Um, they might have someone that they they know uh, will be around um, who can, you know, just be present. Um, and that way they, they know that they're not going to um, act out. Um, another huge one is just limiting their interaction with minors overall. Um, so they'll, you know, not be in spaces uh, with minors, um, especially one-on-one -on -one, again, um, but they might not be in spaces with minors in general. They might just, if they know that there are going to be kids there, they won't go. Some of them took this to um, a really big extreme where they wouldn't go into public as much um, as they otherwise necessarily might have. Um, but others just, you know, uh, if there was a gathering that they thought there would probably be a lot of children at or um, children in general, they would just excuse themselves from that event, um, knowing that that wasn't a good space for them to be in. Um, others were uh, seeking out support from other maps. So especially um, connecting on groups like um, Before You Act uh, and Verped uh, or Virtuous Pedophiles. Um, these are support groups. Uh, that can allow maps to contact one another and talk about, um, you know, it, it, first of all, if they're um, experiencing any coping uh, issues in general, but also if they're um, feeling like they're they're going to offend. There there are folks who you know reach out um, and can help them, um, you know, with reasons that they shouldn't offend, um, with their own strategies for non-offending, um, with therapists who they um, have had good luck with in the past um, and a number of other resources. So that support there was um, was really beneficial for them. Um, and something that should be talked about as well uh, that, that I haven't m mentioned yet is that so many of the people I talked to really said they didn't have any um, strategies because they just knew that they weren't a risk. Um, so they... Um, some of some of my participants did talk about this kind of temptation that they had or, or urges, um, but the majority said um, that that they never experienced kind of urges to commit a sexual offense. Um, it wasn't like this daily struggle that they were um, trying to keep away from children. It was just like in the back of their mind, they knew they had this attraction and they also knew they weren't going to act on it. 
Um, so there's that really big um, difference there between the folks who felt like they needed these strategies um, and folks who felt like they never really needed one. Um, even some of the folks who never felt they needed one, though, still had these ideas about, well, I mean, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to go hang around with a lot of children, um, given my attractions. So they weren't necessarily framing their strategies in terms of how do I not commit an offense, but they might um, frame them in terms of like, what is the most appropriate thing for me to do, considering that I do have these attractions? Um, and they would kind of draw that line as well. So I guess my last question was, you know, um, I just kind of wondered, have you experienced a lot of pushback to your book, like in the academy or from the public? I mean, I know that these issues are, are super controversial, and I just kind of wondered, has your book been mostly sort of like accepted or are people skeptical? Um, oh, sorry, what was the last part? Oh, are people skeptical or, you know? Gotcha. Um, so I've had a little bit of pushback here and there. Um, it is a, it's a risky topic to research in terms of what the public thinks about maps. Um, and even in terms of what other people in my field think, um, usually in terms of other researchers, they'll just say that the topic of my research is something that they don't want to think about. Um, and we won't discuss it. Um, or they won't understand it at all. Uh, even if we're like in conversation about it. So I remember a professor of mine asking about my research. Um, and when I said I was studying people who are attracted to children who don't commit offenses, he said, Oh, okay. So sex offenders. And I clarified, no, they have attractions to minors, but they haven't committed an act of sexual abuse. And he said, right, sex offenders. Um, he just like could not completely not comprehend uh, the population that I was talking about. Um, I had another professor who, when I brought up my research interests, she just said yuck and like moved along. So there's been some um, some pushback uh, here and there. Um, I've also received some feedback from the general public saying that, you know, my book encourages maps um, or that it will lead to further offending. But generally that feedback um, seems like it's coming from people who haven't read my book um, and are instead just reacting to what they think the book is about without taking the time to read it first. Um, and then some of the negative reactions I've uh, heard also attack me based on my gender identity. Um, my, my identity is a trans person. So those reactions have been hurtful just because it always sucks to read hate against trans people. Um, but generally people seem pretty receptive to my book. Uh, I've heard some really great feedback from people who study criminology and think the subject of this book is important toward preventing sexual abuse against children. Uh, I've also had a lot of conversations with people who go into social work, uh, and are just like me before I had understood the difference between maps and sex offenders. So, um, they've just started understanding this and they want to learn more. And I always feel really grateful to those who find this to be an uncomfortable subject uh, and who are still willing to learn more about it. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, we've been talking to Alan Walker, who's the assistant professor at Old Dominion University in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice. Their book is A Long Dark Shadow, Minor Attracted Persons and Their Pursuit of Dignity. And, um, yeah, this is Prestasia Conversations, Prestasia, um, where Prestasia tries to have conversations on these difficult subjects. And if you found this, podca this podcast valuable, um, consider donating so that we can continue to do this work. Mm -hmm.